without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to your co-host today. Uh, we have Jessica Corcoran, the Executive Director of the Erdheim Chester Disease Global Alliance, and Deanna Fournier, the Executive Director of the Histiocytosis Association. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. We're really happy to have you here. And uh, I'm Jesse, the Executive Director of the ECD Global Alliance. And uh, we're grateful to be here today to discuss the opportunity to dive, or the opportunity to dive into these uh, published guidelines for these specific histiocytoses. And uh, we're happily partnering with the Histiocytosis Association to bring you this webinar. And here is Deanna Fournier. Thank you, Jesse, and welcome to everyone who's joining us today. We're incredibly grateful for the opportunity to partner with the ECD Global Alliance and with our um, experts today who are going to be taking you through these very important guidelines for uh, three of the histiocytic disorders for adults. Um, if you have any questions throughout, feel free, like we mentioned, to reach out to us. We'll be monitoring the chat and the Q&A. And I will just say that working together for the good of the community um, is really what we're here for. Um, and so collaborating on projects, sharing materials and information, um, that's really the benefit of partnering with uh, the ECD Global Alliance for the association as well, and for all of you. So we're really, really grateful to be here today and to be able to support this important work. So, um, Jesse, would you like to introduce our speakers for the day? Sure, we have Dr. Ronald Goh with uh, the Hematology Division at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Dr. Jer Eric Jacobson uh, with Hematology and Oncology Department at uh, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. And the moderator for today is Dr. Eli Diamond from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center from New York. Dr. Go will be starting us off today. All right. Well, thank you uh, all for um, participating today. And again, I would like to thank the uh, ECDGA and also the Histocytosis Association for hosting this. Um, and on behalf of my co-speaker here, Dr. Eric Jacobs, and I thank you all. Uh, and also thank you, Dr. Eli Diamond for moderating today. Um, next slide. Yeah, so this is our you know, uh, disclaimer NCCN. Uh, the presentation today is or was approved by the NCCN. So this is the agenda for today. We're just gonna quickly go through the genesis of the NCCN guideline. And then Dr. Jacobson will talk about the ECD presentation and guidelines. I'll go over the LCH and then Dr. Jacobson will complete the talk uh, with RDD, and then we'll start with a Q&A. So um, the genesis of the NCCN guideline. So the idea to put together or suggest NCCN guidelines uh, was, uh, it, it started in November of 2018. It was a Sunday afternoon during the ECDGA meeting in Orlando. And thanks to uh, Dr. Jacobson, he suggested actually this idea, and it was definitely well uh, was supported by the whole group. And the next thing that happened was we talked to NCCN, and this resulted in a presentation. Um, I, I was going to call this the, like an oral argument. Dr. Jacobson actually was the one who represented us. Uh, at the NCCN meeting in 2019, and shortly thereafter, it was approved. And about a year later, uh, we had the first panel meeting. It was in January of 2020. And shortly thereafter, about a year and a half or a year and three months, uh, we have the uh, first guidelines published. The, uh, the article will be published, I think, in, in September of this year but the preliminary version of the guideline is already available in the web. The next slide, please. So uh, there are many histocytic disorders, and um, I use the word disease here because some are considered neoplastic or malignant and some are not. And so if you look at the nature of these conditions, some have clones or mutations, and some do not at least not for the moment, we haven't identified any mutations. And some are truly reactive in nature. They are 
inflammation, uh, some types of inflammation and in reactive or secondary to an underlying problem or condition. And if you look at the uh, major subtypes, the, the big three are uh, LCH or Langerhans cell histocytosis, Erdheim Chester disease, and Rosai Dortmann disease. And you know, th these big three histocytic conditions are primarily clonal in nature. Um, however, Rosai Dortmann disease, we believe there is a substantial proportion of patients with this condition may be due to a reactive uh, element wherein we are unable to find a clone. A clone. Um, and then there are the other less common subtypes, santogranulomas, uh, HLH, and also the malignant ones, the sarcomas. Um, many of these are clonal in nature, although uh, a substantial proportion are reactive, such as the HLH and also the, some of the santogranulomas. Next slide. So the NCCN guidelines, when we met uh, over a year ago, our decision was to start with adult conditions. And so these guidelines will cover the guidelines in adult patients. A pediatric version will come out later or actually uh, will be convened, a panel will be convened to go over the pediatric guidelines. Um, while Rosa Dortman disease is not yet considered a neoplasm by the World Health Organization, it is likely that in the future, some of the Rosa Dortman diseases will be considered neoplasm. But for the purpose of these guidelines, we are uh, considering Rosa Dortman disease, at least uh, uh, some of them, to be neoplastic. Next slide. So this is a work uh, coming from multiple groups. The NCCN membership is comprised of over 30 institutions. And this is a, uh, the represent representatives actually from the various institutions when we first met. Next slide. I'm gonna hand over the uh, uh, the talk to Dr. Jacobson, and he will talk about ECB, and I'll come back to talk about LCH. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate uh, that wonderful introduction. I uh, would also like to echo your thanks to the NCCN, uh, the ECD Global Alliance, and also the Histiocytosis Association for, for making this possible. I think this is really a tremendous uh, advance for our patients and for our field. And um, although Ron and I are the speakers today, Eli Diamond has uh, kindly uh, joined, uh, agreed to join as well, and, and really deserves a lot of the credit for advancing the field and, and developing some of the molecularly targeted therapies that I'll be discussing in the coming slides. So thank you, Eli, and, and also uh, Julian Hiroche in France, who is not here today, was also uh, really instrumental in developing some of these newer therapies. So just wanna make sure that they're properly acknowledged uh, for some of these advances. <clears throat> so ECD, uh, as, as most, I think everyone knows on this call, is, is a very rare disease. And, and rare diseases in general can be a challenge to diagnose, uh, but ECD in particular can be a very protean illness and can have many different manifestations. And you know, most of my work is, is in oncology where there are not typically a lot of diagnostic dilemmas, but with, with ECD, uh, it really can be a diagnostic dilemma. And I think this slide highlights the importance of having involvement from a number of different specialties, not just oncology, uh, but various other subspecialties, including dermatology, ophthalmology, endocrinology, to help diagnose this condition, but also help to manage not only complications from the disease itself, but potential complications from, from treatment. So the classic areas of involvement with ECD include uh, bilateral symmetric involvement of the long bones. And it's been my experience that not uncommonly, it's actually the radiologists that will raise ECD as a potential diagnosis. Uh, they seem to be aware of, of this rare but characteristic radiographic finding in the long bones. <clears throat> 
The disease also classically affects the retroperitoneum and gives a so-called hairy appearance to the kidney, where you'll see these, as the name implies, hair-like projections uh, from the kidney. And then uh, also commonly there's involvement of the cardiovascular system, including the right atrium uh, and the aorta. But as this slide shows, really uh, ECD can and does affect just about uh, any organ system, including dermatologic involvement, periorbital involvement, uh, nervous system involvement, which again, Eli has been very instrumental uh, in identifying. Um, so it, it's, it's a disease that requires a lot of education, uh, both not, with, not only within oncology, but throughout a variety of other uh, subspecialties. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to read to you um, this entire slide and, and the diagnostic evaluation for ECD. Suffice it to say, as I mentioned previously, really you have to, to view the entire patient. You know, again, in, in most of oncology, we tend to be quite focused on, on a specific uh, disease or, or a specific area of involvement like colon cancer or breast cancer or lung cancer. ECD by nature is, is often if not always a systemic disease and therefore it requires systemic evaluation. So imaging, of course, important, including a uh, whole body PET scan, MRI of the brain to look for, for neurologic involvement, cardiac MRI, which is a very good way to assess for cardiac involvement, but also testing that, to be honest, we're not always as familiar with uh, in oncology, including a variety of endocrine studies to look for endocrine complications and then as we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, increasingly uh, uh, next generation sequencing, genetic sequencing and, and various immunohistochemistry techniques are very important, not only in diagnosing the disease, but in determining the optimal uh, therapeutic options. Next slide, please. So as with most um, diseases that we encounter, you know, biopsy is really the, the gold standard for establishing the diagnosis. And I will say, and, and others uh, on the call, Eli and Ron, feel free to, to chime in if you have other thoughts, but I will say that um, obtaining tissue in ECD can sometimes be a little more challenging than some of the other diseases that we see. Uh, bone biopsies can be notoriously difficult, not only procedurally, but also obtaining adequate tissue. Uh, sometimes the retroperitoneal involvement can be very sparse and can be difficult to biopsy. And then obviously, if there's involvement of areas like the nervous system or the cardiovascular system, those can be challenging areas to biopsy. So sometimes obtaining sufficient tissue to perform all the tests that we hope to perform uh, can be a little bit problematic. But the hallmark feature uh, on a biopsy of ECD is, are these foamy, uh, lipid-laden histiocytes, giant histiocytes called Teuton cells. Although there's often a fair amount of background fibrosis and uh, an inflammatory infiltrate often of lymphoplasmacytic cells, and I've seen a number of cases that are occasionally uh, initially diagnosed as, as various types of lymphomas that can have a similar histologic appearance. So expert review of the pathology is very critical to making sure we establish the diagnosis. <clears throat> when, we, when we have diagnostic tissue, there's several key tests that we like to perform. Uh, one is immunohistochemistry staining for the BRAF B600E mutation, which occurs in a, approximately 50% of cases. This test is not always so clear cut. Uh, there are situations where the BRAF testing is strongly positive, And I think all of us are comfortable saying that that equates to a BRAF mutation. But there are situations where the BRAF staining on immunohistochemistry can be equivocal. And that's where genetic sequencing really becomes important to rule in or rule out this mutation. And also potentially to identify other mutations within the MAP kinase or the RAS-RAF uh, pathway. Uh, again, making, making uh, acquisition of sufficient tissue very important for all the diagnostic tests that we need. ECD has a relatively characteristic uh, profile in immunohistochemistry, so it does express uh, CD68 and CD163, which is typical of, of many uh, diseases within the histiocyte spectrum. Unlike Langerhans cell histiocytosis, it does not express CD1A or Langerhans, so that's a very important way of distinguishing these two entities. 
occasionally, um, you know, despite all the testing, either because of technical reasons or inadequate tissue, uh, we aren't able to perform uh, sufficient BRAF testing, um, in which case uh, we did uh, create guidelines actually uh, for the setting in which the mutation status is unknown, acknowledging that this can happen. I should also note it's important uh, to mention there is an increased risk of myeloid neoplasms in patients uh, with histiocyte diseases. So monitoring patients' blood counts and having a degree of suspicion for what we call a secondary myeloid neoplasm is important in these diagnoses. So this is sort of a broad overview of how we approach the diagnosis of the disease and some of the associated uh, conditions, but we can delve now on the next slide into some of the therapeutic options. The, um, the approach to managing ECD, um, I view almost uh, like a low-grade lymphoma. So there are certain slow-growing lymphomas where watchful waiting or close monitoring are, are appropriate. And occasionally that is appropriate in ECD. I have seen cases that are incidentally diagnosed at the time of an unrelated orthopedic injury and patients have routine x-rays where this osteosclerosis is noted in the bones and, and they're otherwise asymptomatic and do not have any involvement of critical organs. And I think in that patient population, uh, observation is certainly a reasonable option. For other patients who have uh, involvement near the kidney or cardiac involvement or neurologic involvement, systemic therapy is certainly warranted uh, to to manage any complications of the disease or prevent complications in those critical organ systems. We'll talk about uh, therapy in a little bit, uh, but in terms of, of how we monitor these patients, both in a watchful waiting setting uh, without treatment or when they're on treatment, again, there really have not been studies to, to define the optimal interval between scans. Uh, this is true, to be honest, in, in much more common diseases such as lymphoma, where there's controversy as to the utility of routine imaging and how frequently that imaging should be performed. Uh, but essentially, uh, particularly for patients on treatment, PET-CT is repeated every three to six months uh, from the initiation of treatment until the disease has stabilized. And then I tend to perform uh, PET-CT scans much less frequently uh, at that juncture. Depending on areas that are affected, Sometimes we do need a specific um, organ imaging, such as MRI for central nervous system involvement. Again, no more frequently than every three to six months, and uh, even less frequently every six to 12 months once the disease has stabilized on treatment or in the case of watchful waiting, uh, has proven to be non-progressing over, over a period of time. Uh, skin examination is important. Um, one, potentially for cutaneous involvement of the disease itself, but as we'll talk about, some of the treatments that we use, particularly BRAF inhibitors, can have skin toxicity. Also, um, some of these drugs can have cardiac toxicity, so ECG monitoring uh, is also very important. And then monitoring of pituitary hormone levels uh, every one to two years, I usually invoke the help of an endocrinologist, to be honest, for interpretation of some of these tests. But often the uh, blood test can be a better reflection of pituitary function than any changes that we see on imaging. Next slide, please. So I mentioned uh, at the beginning that, that Eli and uh, Julian Hirosh really, uh, really uh, rang in the era of targeted therapy in histiocytic neoplasms. And I think that's been uh, very evident in ECD and is increasingly evident in some of the other diseases that we'll talk about. And I have to say, uh, in my clinic, and I think for most of us, these newer targeted therapies have really moved to the forefront of treatment. And some of the treatments uh, that we use historically, such as pegylated interferon, uh, have a lesser role. I wouldn't say no role, but they've, they've become sort of secondary treatments to these newer targeted uh, therapies. So for patients in whom there's a demonstrable BRAF uh, V600E mutation, uh, BRAF inhibitors, not surprisingly, are commonly used. Uh, Vemurafenib uh, approved now uh, by the FDA in erdheim chester disease um, is, is commonly used, although dabrafenib is also used, and I think it's not 
quite clear uh, which of either is superior to the other, and I would consider both to be acceptable based upon patient and uh, physician preference. For patients who do not have a demonstrable mutation or uh, in whom no testing is available or who have mutations elsewhere in the MAP kinase pathway outside of the BRAF B600E mutation, then cobimetinib, uh, the MEK inhibitor, or uh, certainly another MEK inhibitor called trametinib are very viable options, uh, extremely active. So Eli published a paper uh, in Nature, I guess it was probably a year or two ago now, maybe two. The time has kind of morphed with the, with the pandemic, but uh, showing that these, these agents, or at least in this particular paper, cobimetinib is extremely active uh, in ECD. Almost all patients respond to treatment, uh, and thus far, very few patients have progressed on treatment, although we do not have yet a uh, very long-term follow-up on these therapies. So I would say for certainly for the BRAF mutant disease, um, BRAF inhibitors, and, and for other patients, MEK inhibitors have really moved to the forefront of treatment. I mentioned historically, pegylated interferon was, was probably the most commonly used treatment. Uh, certainly can have a role in, in patients who can't tolerate BRAF or MEK inhibitors or uh, those patients who may happen to, to not respond to, to BRAF or MEK inhibitors. Chemotherapy, uh, such as cladribine, that's been utilized historically in histiocyte disorders, that, you know, again, I would say I use extremely infrequently nowadays in ECD. It's been a while uh, since I've had a patient on chemotherapy, but certainly remains an option. And then there are some other therapeutic options like low-dose oral methotrexate uh, or anakinra, uh, or sirolimus and prednisone that we've used historically that, again, still have a role in, in selected patients, but have really taken a backseat to these targeted therapies. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see some uh, much less common mutations that have been described in ECD. There are now uh, drugs that target these various mutations. I would say the experience with each of them in ECD is relatively limited. Uh, but they do remain viable options for a small subset of patients. Next slide, please. So I think uh, with that, uh, I'll turn uh, the forum back over to Dr. Go. He'll go through LCH, uh, and then uh, at the end, we'll we'll talk about Rose Dorfman disease. Thank you, Eric. Um, and you'll see there are many similarities among the three uh, top three histiocytic uh, neoplasms here. And therefore, the treatment paradigm, and including clinical presentation, uh, there are uh, lots of similarities. And so for present, clinical presentation for Langerhans cell histocytosis, the predominant presentation is bone, and it's uh, what we call lytic lesions, or there's breakdown of the bone. In Erdheim Chester disease, it's primarily sclerotic or uh, uh, sclerotic lesions or thickening of the bones. Um, the other main manifestation of uh, Langerhans cell histocytosis is actually pulmonary involvement, where about half of the patients, especially among smokers, will have what we call cystic and nodular lesions in the upper uh, lung fields. And then the rest, uh, including diabetes insipidus, endocrine symptoms, and sometimes central nervous system uh, symptoms uh, we will see in LCH as well. The skin lesions, central asthma around uh, lesions, yellow patches around the eyes, we also see in LCH and, and certainly in younger patients, uh, especially in pediatrics, we see papular rashes uh, as well. Uh, next slide, please. The Workup and evaluation, again, is very similar to Erdheim Chester disease. Uh, of course, one uh, has to get a good medical history and physical examination. Um, it is interesting that the diabetes insipidus tip, uh, frequently present years prior to the diagnosis of uh, Erdheim Chester or Langerhans cell histocytosis, and therefore these are sometimes uh, remote, part of the remote history of the patient, and they may seemingly be unrelated, but uh, now that we know more about these diseases, we think that the DI or diabetes insipidus uh, 
is uh, can be a very early presentation of uh, these the histocytic neoplasms. Once you get a, a good history and physical examination, we typically recommend staging the patients with PET-CT scan. Um, and this is to determine the extent of the disease. There's still controversy when patients present with isolated pulmonary symptoms. And so patients with seemingly pulmonary only LCH, is there a a utility of doing a PET-CT scan, and that's still being investigated. Um, but certainly for pulmonary involvement, a high resolution CT scan is recommended for further uh, definition of the lung findings. And again, in selected patients, um, MRI of the heart uh, or the brain uh, can be performed, lung function tests and so forth. The laboratory evaluation is very similar to ECD, and we typically include endocrine testing. And just like uh, Eric, I typically employ the assistance of our endocrinologist here. Um, we also have a, uh, experts in dermatology or skin lesions. We typically consult them. And so depending on the clinical involvement, the areas of clinical involvement, we may we recommend consultations with the other disciplines as listed there, pulmonary neurology, endocrine, and dermatology. Um, and certainly for patients who are smoker, uh, smoking cessation is an important part of the management. Next slide, please. Similar to ECD, tissue biopsy is important. And uh, we try to or attempt a biopsy as much as possible. Um, and since the frequent initial finding is bony lesion, a bone biopsy is quite common. And the typical immunohistochemistry staining for LCH uh, is uh, positivity of the CD1A and Langerine or CD207. Uh, S100 is also uh, positive, but the other stainings that we see in ECD, like factor 13, we typically do not see. About 60% of the patients with LCH in adults have a BRAP B600E mutation. This can be detected by staining uh, for the most part. However, uh, when a bone, a bone biopsy is performed, sometimes the staining does not work as well, and therefore molecular testing with what we call next generation sequencing or PCR is typically performed to confirm or uh, uh, find the uh, mutations involved. And um, for, with regards to treatment, um, we certainly take into account what type of mutation is present or even the lack of mutation. Um, a bone marrow biopsy, in our experience, uh, we, we typically do a bone marrow biopsy if the CBC or complete blood count is abnormal or if the PET-CT scan shows abnormalities in the bone marrow. Um, in our experience, um, about 5% of the patients or less may have a primary bone marrow pathology. For example, um, uh, CMML or chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, sometimes polycythemia vera. So these are, uh, typically they have elevation of the, their blood counts, whether it's red cells, white cells, or platelets. So all, those are signs of potential bone marrow uh, involvement due to a second um, blood cancer. Next slide, please. As far as treatment, um, there are, it, it really depends on the involvement and also the presence or absence of symptoms. Similar to what Dr. Jacobson said, you know, this, uh, the histocytic neoplasms, the management is similar to low-grade lymphoma. If they don't have any symptoms and there's no critical organ involvement, typically observation is recommended. So in this case here, in this slide, unifocal LCH, if there is isolated bone involvement, Typically, we, we perform either a biopsy or limited curatage. And I've seen patients uh, wherein their symptoms actually go away after the biopsy or curatage. 
and we have served them for years. Local therapy with injection, corticosteroid injections, or sometimes radiation, if there's limited number of bone involvement, can also be used, and they're quite effective. For skin disease uh, or skin involvement, certainly watch and wait or topical treatments as listed there uh, can be used also. Uh, for the other sites outside of the bone and the skin, and if there's no critical organ involvement, such as the nervous system, the liver, or the heart, then certainly watch and wait approach uh, can be employed. And next slide, please. If there are multi-system involvement, again, the first thing is to find out if there is uh, any symptom and also which organs are involved. If the, if the patient is symptomatic, or if the organs involved are critical, then of course systemic therapy is uh, recommended. For patients with multifocal or mul multiple bone disease, there are studies to suggest that treatment with bisphosphonate such as pomidronate or solidronic acid may help with improvement in the bone lesions and bone pain. Certainly radiation therapy can be also employed here. One thing that is unique for the LCH is uh, if this is primarily lung involvement, the first question is, is the patient smoking? Cert most of the patients with pulmonary only LCH are smokers and therefore smoking cessation is the first treatment or management of choice majority of the patients will have improvement with their symptoms or even radiographic improvements after smoking cessation. It is only after smoking cessation and if there's no improvement in the pulmonary findings, uh, um, it, that is when we recommend systemic therapy. There are rare patients with severe pulmonary dysfunction and they may require lung transplantation. Next slide, please. As far as follow-up, um, the follow-up guidelines here and surveillance are based on consensus opinion and certainly not evidence-based. But as Dr. Jacobson um, discussed earlier, we typically would perform imaging studies while on therapy every three to four months and then uh, do less, fre less frequent monitoring, if at all, afterwards. Uh, this is to minimize radiation exposure as many of our patients are young. Next slide, please. As far as systemic therapy, you can see that this table is similar to the ECD table. It really depends on um, whether the sites of involvement is unifocal or unisystem or multi-system. It also depends on the mutations. And certainly if you have, uh, if the treatment is necessary, then um, they're, they're, the choice is either targeted agents or chemotherapy. The targeted agents have the uh, advantage of a very, very high response rate, uh, but the disadvantage is typically uh, we have to keep them on the treatment for long periods of time as, uh, relapses uh, do occur in most patients, as, at least in the ECD experience, once the targeted agent is discontinued. However, with the use of chemotherapy, uh, the chemotherapy does not work uh, as well as targeted agent. I would say maybe half of the patients will respond to the therapy, but if a response is seen, it is one can discontinue treatment after several months or cycles of treatment and they may have a, an unmaintained or treatment-free remission for quite some time. As discussed earlier, we can use bisphosphonates for bone-only disease. And for skin-only uh, involvement, there are some reports of using oral methotrexate, hydroxyurea, and some of these imids in the literature, and therefore um, may not need the, the high power chemotherapeutic agents. Next slide, please. For CNS lesions, um, it is uh, 
based on studies uh, by Dr. Diamond and others, that the bimirapinib and cobimetinib typically will work in central nervous system lesions. In other words, the drug will penetrate the blood-brain barrier. Um, and if chemotherapy is going to be used, certainly the recommendation is to use drugs that uh, we know penetrate the blood-brain barrier, such as high-dose methotrexate, cytarabine, or cladribine. Next slide, please. Eric. Thank you. Uh, so we'll finish up our discussion of, of the three most common uh, histiocytoses with a discussion of Rose Dorfman disease. And, you know, as with Erdheim Chester disease and uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, this is really a disease that can and does manifest uh, in just about any organ system, though. Uh, the most common uh, certainly would be the bones, uh, the skin, and, and the lymph nodes. And the classic presentation of Rose Dorfman disease is, is often, at least in children, uh, massive cervical lymphadenopathy that in most cases spontaneously resolves. And for a long time, it was thought, and to some degree still thought, that maybe in that context, RDD was driven by an infectious agent, though to date, uh, no infectious agent has been uh, definitively identified. In adult populations, uh, the disease is a little bit different. We don't tend to see that massive cervical lymphadenopathy. It, it does present with lymphadenopathy, but not, not the classic presentation you see in children. Um, I think the important thing to know about RDD in adult is its association with other conditions. So RDD in adults can frequently be, be seen in the context of autoimmune diseases, uh, most classically lupus, but other diseases as well. It's been my experience when we see RDD in the context of autoimmune illness, the autoimmune illness has already been recognized. So it's rare that someone is diagnosed with RDD and then subsequently diagnosed with lupus. It's almost always someone with longstanding lupus who develops adenopathy and has a biopsy that shows uh, RDD. The other uh, very important thing to know about RDD in adults is that uh, not infrequently, it's associated with uh, lymphomas, classically Hodgkin lymphoma, but also non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And it can sometimes be a challenge to rule out concomitant involvement with lymphoma and RDD. I always say it's easier sometimes to prove somebody has something than to prove that they don't. Uh, and sometimes we do need to perform uh, multiple biopsies to be comfortable saying there's not a concomitant lymphoma. Uh, particularly in the setting of, of lymph node involvement. And then there are some other uh, very rare conditions, including inherited familial uh, RDD and, and autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, uh, where we do see this condition, but, but that's a very, very small number of, of patients. Next slide, please. As with the previous two conditions, really uh, evaluation of, of every organ system, either by uh, history and physical exam and or imaging, uh, is very important. Um, I often perform uh, PET-CT in, in this patient population, again, largely to exclude other concomitant uh, conditions such as lymphoma, but also uh, to assess the extent of the disease. And then, as previously uh, noted uh, for, for LCH and ECD, targeting targeted imaging of certain uh, organ systems, such as uh, the brain uh, or the heart or the thyroid can be important depending on the clinical context. And then a similar uh, battery of, of blood tests that we send for RDD uh, as we send for the other histiocyte conditions. Next slide, please. So uh, again, biopsy, uh, very important uh, to definitively establish the diagnosis. Uh, typically, the histiocytes of RDD are, are not as, as large as what we see in ECD and don't have the lipid-filled uh, appearance. They frequently, though not always, have empiropoiesis, which is ingestion of intact uh, red cells and other hematopoietic elements uh, within the histiocyte. So this is different from HLH, where you more commonly see a red cell and other hematopoietic fragments rather than intact uh, cells. On immunohistochemistry, uh, typically these cells are S100 positive, and again, typical of their monocyte and 
histiocyte derivation are CD68 and CD6, uh, CD163 positive. And again, differentiating from LCH, uh, CD1A and, and Langren are negative. And then as with prior conditions, uh, NGS to look for MAP kinase mutations uh, is very important, uh, though much less common uh, to see BRAF mutations in this disease than it is to see them in, in LCH or, or ECD. Next slide, please. Uh, re repeating the theme in the, in the previous two guidelines, uh, again, uh, for, for many patients, whether they have multifocal or unifocal disease, if they're asymptomatic and uh, there's no danger of organ compromise, then watchful waiting is perfectly appropriate and, and spontaneous remissions are well described in RDD and patients will sometimes improve on their own uh, without any intervention. For unifocal disease that can be resected, uh, surgical resection is often performed as long as the morbidity from the resection itself is not uh, unacceptable. If patients have symptomatic unifocal disease that's not amenable to resection or symptomatic uh, multifocal disease, then systemic therapy would be considered or in some cases, uh, palliative radiation, uh, particularly for CNS tumors or ocular or periocular involvement. And the follow-up imaging guidelines for RDD, um, again, as, as Ron mentioned for LCH and I mentioned for ECD are not really evidence-based, this is expert consensus and therefore are quite similar uh, to the recommendations in the previous two conditions. Next slide, please. So there are a variety of therapeutic options for RDD. Um, again, as with LCH and ECD, uh, targeted therapies, uh, particularly MEK inhibitors, certainly do have a role. As I mentioned, BRAF mutation is, is not very common in RDD. Uh, should it happen to be present or if there's an overlap syndrome between RDD and another histiocyte disorder where, where BRAF is mutated, then BRAF inhibitors certainly could be relevant. But I would say for targeted therapies, uh, MEK inhibitors are much more relevant in RDD. I mentioned in ECD uh, that it's rare uh, nowadays that I use chemotherapy. I would say in RDD, uh, I don't always make the leap uh, to a MEK inhibitor. Sometimes I do use systemic steroids or low-dose oral methotrexate uh, before I would use a MEK inhibitor. It really depends on, on the extent, the bulk, and, and the severity of the disease. I would say it's, it's fairly infrequent for me anyway uh, to use other cytotoxic chemotherapy like cladribine, cytarabine, or vinblastine. Again, those, those do have a role, but I think they've moved down uh, the list in our therapeutic armamentarium. I mentioned that RDD can be associated with autoimmune illness. Typically, or often, treatment of the underlying autoimmune illness will induce regression of the RDD, presumably. Uh, it's the inflamed uh, milieu of, of autoimmune illness that is driving this RDD-like reaction. And if you treat the autoimmune illness, the RDD regresses. And so that's why rituximab, for instance, can be useful in RDD associated with autoimmune illness because you're removing the underlying stimulus. You're probably not targeting uh, the histiocyte process itself since CD20, which is the target of rituximab, is not broadly expressed on histiocyte disorders. And as with the other conditions, there are a variety of rare mutations that are found in RDD for which we have targeted therapies available. I would say, again, uh, those are used infrequently, uh, but potential options in appropriate patients. But I think for me, the take home message of RDD is always its association with other conditions, particularly lymphoma, but also being aware uh, that you can see this RDD-like process in, in autoimmune illness. And I think also the observation that it is infrequently a life-threatening disease. And that's why I typically take a much more stepwise approach with treatment and try to use uh, the least invasive treatments possible for the shortest duration possible so as not to induce unnecessary side effects in, in a disease that typically has a very favorable prognosis. Next slide, please. So I think uh, with that, a uh, brief overview.
we'll um, we'll finish up and and Eli has kindly agreed to moderate the question and answer uh, portion of this presentation. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Go and Dr. Jacobson, and I just I want to um, just express my own kudos and, and admiration for your very hard work um, in putting these guidelines together. It's a great deal of effort um, to put something like this with such um, logical and meticulous uh, organization. So I congratulate you on that. Um, a few questions um, uh, centered upon the, the use of um, blood testing for BRAF and other mutations. Um, so maybe um, uh, Ron, do you wanna um, comment a bit on where, what the role of these in the guidelines is and maybe what they are in your in your practice for BRAF and for other mutations? Yeah, thank you, Eli. So for, we typically, at least in our, at our institution um, and in the guidelines, we certainly recommend testing the tissue biopsy first. And if that is not possible, uh, going to the blood to look for circulating cell-free uh, DNA uh, uh, of the mutation uh, is another option, uh, but typically we start with the tissue, and if tissue is not available or if it tests negative, then uh, we we test the blood. Yeah, Eric, any other suggestions or comments? No, I would say our our practice uh, largely reflects what you described. Uh, we do have an in-house platform called a Rapid Heme Panel that that I often obtain even if tissue testing has been done, uh, and not always uh, with the intent of looking for mutations associated with the, with the histiocyte disorder, but looking for mutations associated with a secondary myeloid neoplasm. Um, sometimes insurance coverage can be an issue with uh, doing genetic testing on, on multiple different tissue compartments, but if possible, we, we test the blood uh, and tissue. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add in, in response to one specific question in the chat that um, uh, other mutations such as MAP2K1 are detectable by some of these blood um, tests. Uh, and I think that um, the experience has been that if those are positive, that mutation is probably present and in the histiocytosis, but if negative, it doesn't mean that it's, that it's not there. So there's some, there's some room to improve with the accuracy of those, um, of those tests. Um, another um, question is, um, in terms of single system but multifocal disease, um, you know, do you think of you know multiple skin lesions or multiple bone lesions as opposed to smaller number? Or is the approach to those um, different? Um, uh, say multiple bone lesions versus a smaller number of bone lesions. Do those behave differently? Ron? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so I think we're still trying to understand and study the natural history of uh, uh, Langerhans cell histocytosis and also the other histocytosis here discussed today. Um, there, is very, there are very few literature out there uh, looking at the natural history of unifocal or oligofocal disease. Um, I, I think as you know, if, if we want to look at therapy, I guess it depends on on um, how many lesions are there. Uh, certainly if it's probably three or less lesions. Um, we typically try local therapies, but if it's more than three uh, lesions, um, I think uh, we, we typically would try systemic therapy. But of course, you know, you got to individualize the, the treatment. Yeah, Eric? Yeah, I would agree, I would agree with that. It's um, number and also lo location, you know, if there's uh, you know, a, a proximal femur lesion or, or cortical disruption or, or a feature of the bone involvement that you're worried about, you'd be more inclined to initiate systemic treatment even if there were fewer lesions. Um, if there are multiple lesions, but they're small and asymptomatic and, and not in danger of, of causing a fracture or otherwise significant compromise of the bone, then, then observation can sometimes be appropriate. So it's it often becomes a little more art than science. Um, and in many of those cases with multifocal bone involvement, I often start with bisphosphonates. Uh, and if they're effective, it's a relatively non-toxic way uh, to palliate or even eliminate some of these bone lesions. And then uh, 
only consider escalating to other systemic therapies if bisphosphonates are, are not effective. For skin disease, you know, we recently looked at and, and published our experience with skin LCH, and um, it's a, a comparatively small proportion of patients who present with skin-only LCH that go on to develop systemic LCH. Now, admittedly, the median follow-up on that analysis is relatively short, so it's possible that over a longer period of time, more of these patients will uh, develop uh, systemic disease. But I think it's it's reflective of other hematopoietic processes that we see in the skin, for instance, cutaneous lymphomas that uh, have a biological predisposition to remain in the skin. So it may be that cutaneous LCH has a little more of a, a biological predisposition to stay in the skin rather than spread systemically. So we usually use more skin-directed therapies, topical therapies in that circumstance rather than systemic therapies. Thanks. Um... We'll change gears a bit. Um, there's been some questions about sort of long-term surveillance um, for I think patients with histiocytosis generally, and maybe for um, um, uh, young adults with uh, LCH who were treated earlier in life. Um, for someone who's been treated successfully, what, what's the what's the approach to surveillance? You know, in the in the very long term, and um, what do you what do you see as the sort of a, the likelihood of, of relapse as, as time, you know, goes on over many, many years. Yeah, thank you, Eli. Yeah, so again, as discussed earlier, this is uh, an area of active uh, investigation. We're looking at our cohort also to see what's the long-term outcome. Um, I have to say that at our institution, we don't see as many pediatric uh, cases of LCH. Uh, certainly ECD is almost mostly I would say predominantly in adults. Um, and therefore I haven't actually seen much pediatric patients who have transitioned into the adult clinics here. Uh, and, and Eric, I think may be able to uh, provide a little bit more uh, uh, experience on that. But um, for my adult patients who have been treated um, and certainly some of them have been treated with systemic chemotherapy. They go in remission. Um, I have performed PET-CT cup, every couple of months for the, probably the first year during and after their treatment. But beyond that, I typically follow them with history and physical examination. Um, I would say at least every, uh, every six or 12 months and then perform imaging studies when there are signs or symptoms. I, I would say occasionally I do another scan after a couple of years. This is to minimize uh, radiation exposure. Eric, yeah. Yeah, uh, my colleagues at Boston Children's Hospital have a fairly uh, robust histiocytosis clinic. Um, so it's not unusual that as patients get older, they're, they're transitioning from the pediatric clinic to the adult clinic. Uh, a, a couple of observations, you know, one is even in patients who've been in remission for the very long term, I still like to see those patients at least annually. Um, occasionally, we have seen very late recurrences of the disease. I have patients who are treated when they were, you know, eight or 10 years old and then have a recurrence uh, of LCH in their 30s or 40s. Again, that's not the norm, but it can happen. Um, so my preference is to see patients once a year. I don't, as Ron said, I don't perform routine imaging in patients who are in long-term remissions, only targeted imaging if there is a, a concern for recurrence. Um, there's often other issues that come up that, uh, to be honest, I, I may have to refer to a subspecialist, but you know, as patients go from the pediatric clinic to the adult clinic, fertility uh, becomes more and more of a question. Uh, Eli, you know this better than I, but you know, occasionally you do see these late neurodegenerative complications um, that can be very subtle. Uh, and I think having that longitudinal follow-up every year is very helpful to detect any changes in, in patient's speech pattern or memory or other things that may be uh, early indicators of the neurodegenerative syndrome. And then for patients who've had systemic chemotherapy, uh, also monitoring for, for any long-term complications such as secondary myeloid uh, neoplasms like MDS. Great, thanks. Um, one question um, uh, is um, there, 
can you describe a little bit the the collaboration with pathologists on the guidelines and are there um are there specific suggestions in terms of you know um, tissue handling or guidance for um, patients uh, um, providers sending patients for biopsies? I think that, that, that those may be present in terms of suggesting non decalcification bone lesions things like that. Yeah. Thank you, Eli. We we do have uh, two pathologists in our panel, um, and in the uh, written form of the. Um, NCCN guideline, which will come out in September. Uh, there will be a little bit more guidance on how to handle the tissues. Um, certainly decalcified tissues can be, uh, can uh, actually present a challenge with certain immunohistochemistry staining, including BRAF, um, and also may also affect the performance of the next gen sequencing or PCR testing. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, unfortunately, we we rarely have the luxury of being the the first people to make contact with these patients. So they've often had a biopsy already by the time we've met them, um, and so uh, things like re, you know request uh, mentioning decalcification and the impact on on immunohistochemistry can become a challenge. So it's not uncommon that we're we're performing a second biopsy to try to establish or confirm the diagnosis. And in those situations, uh, I preemptively reach out to the pathologists who review these biopsies and, and tell them my clinical concerns so that they're involved early on to help us with tissue handling and, and getting the appropriate studies triaged. Um, yeah, and, and thank you, Eric. Uh, one additional comment is that the, um, Diagnosis, of course, can be very challenging. Typically, there are very few uh, abnormal histocytes that are present in the biopsy specimens. And it is not uncommon for patients to have multiple biopsies over the years. And sometimes, you know, we do see biopsies that were reviewed by our own pathologists, but who were not expert in histocytosis. And uh, certainly, the diagnosis could could be missed, and um, and therefore having a biopsy review at a center with expertise in histocytosis is very important. And I would also say that, particularly with ECD, it's a, a disease where the clinical and radiographic input is almost as important to the diagnosis as the biopsy. Um, we tease our pathologists because almost every biopsy they do nowadays for for anything says could be consistent with X, Y, or Z in the correct clinical context. But um, I think you know, for ECD, as I said, in particular, that, that clinical context and the, the radiographic findings can be really important to establishing the diagnosis. Yeah. Well, thank you, Eric, for bringing that up. I think uh, for ECD in particular, or even staging for LCH and RDD, because overlap can happen the PET CT scan um, has to be from uh, vertex to the toes so that it will also include the long bones below the knees. And otherwise, the uh, typical uh, path, almost pathognomonic uh, uh, lesions that we see in bone scan or PET CT scan uh, may be missed. Um, okay, guys, since we're at the, the top of the hour, I just wanna, I wanna wrap up. Thank you both so much. Um, there's, there are many um, questions we did not have the opportunity to get to, but um, we're happy as the panelists to um, prepare some brief answers to those that can be sent out um, to, the, to the attendees. Um, do our hosts, uh, Deanna, Jesse, have anything you wanna wrap up with? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you to uh, Dr. Go, Dr. Jacobson, Dr. Diamond, and the ECD Global Alliance. Um, this was a very important and um, very informative webinar, so we really appreciate it. Um, we will wrap up just the contact information is here for our speakers, as well as for the Histiocytosis Association and the ECD Global Alliance. Um, we strongly encourage that you reach out to us if you have any additional questions. Um, and as, as Dr. Diamond said, we will see if we can prepare some answers to any questions that we may not have had time for today.
You can access the guidelines at mccn.org. We strongly encourage you to go. It's free. You can create an account and um, any updates to the guidelines will be shared with you once you have an account and you've downloaded those guidelines. So they're available for patients and physicians. Um, and we really encourage you to not only access those for yourself, but also um, anyone on the webinar who is not a physician, um, share these with your physician so that they have access as well. Um, coming soon to your email, we will send out the webinar recording. We also will be sending out a post-meeting survey and we encourage you to uh, participate in that so that you can help us improve. And then we will share instructions on how to access the guidelines that we talked about today as well as additional information about clinical trials and registries. And we have a number of webinars that we host throughout the year. So we encourage you to also um, stay tuned and uh, join us in a future conversation. So thank you all so much for taking time to be with us today. And we look forward to seeing you again in a future educational opportunity. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.